this is wild, man. It's been crazy, this journey. And I'm emotional. This week uh, it has been a tremendous week in the sense of July the 7th, last Tuesday. It's my 20th year anniversary where the Lord delivered me miraculously from prison. I've been out of prison 20 years. July the 7th, 2000, I walked out of those prison doors being sentenced to die from a life sentence. And I, who, who would have ever thought, I sure didn't, never imagined that I would be able to stay out in these streets, not going back to prison for 20 years, and not only staying free from going to prison, but preaching the gospel, the good news. I want to thank the Lord, man. I thank my Lord and Savior. I address him as my papa, and I'm so grateful that papa never gave up on me, that even in the midst of affliction and hopelessness, he was there with me. Even when I got shot six times in my chest, even when my throat was cut, with no hope, not even knowing him, his hand was upon me. I remember walking out the prison door with a garbage bag. I had my legal work. And as that big old gate opened, the first gate, I was going through three gates. The first gate opened, they met me, a correctional officer. And he looked at me straight in the face and he said these words to me. You'll be back in six months. That's what he told me. It shook me. It really did. Because I've been locked up for 11 years. As a matter of fact, I didn't have no ID. I didn't have no birth certificate. I didn't have no driver's license. I didn't have no social security number. And here I am. I'm being released with 10 years of supervised release, probation. Special parole, they call it, in the federal institution. And this officer looked at me. He says, you'll be back in, in six months. And as I walked out the second gate, those words was ringing. And to be honest, they were, they were causing a lot of, a little bit of anxiety. And as I went out that third gate, I went out. Well, it's been 20 years. I reckon he probably got tired of waiting on me to get back. <laughs> I give God all the glory. Man, how you all like my pad? I'm chilling. Beautiful facility, you know, uh, just enjoying the goodness of God in the land of the living. He's been good to me. And nobody in this world is going to stop me from opening my big mouth and worship him and glorify him. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I thank God that he opened up my blind eyes. I was blind. He opened up my eyes that today I can see him as my Lord and Savior, as the keeper of my soul. I thank God for that. I want to read a scripture out of the book of Psalms, Psalm 142. Powerful scripture. It says, verse 7, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me for you are good to me. Bring me out of prison so that I can thank you or so that I can praise you and worship you. He said, that the godly crowd, a crowd of good people, is going to surround me because you've been good to me. I got some people right now sitting around me. I never would dream that God would give me such a company of great people who love God to sit today with me and hear what I have to say. I never even knew what a preacher was. 
I just wanted to be a thug. I just wanted to sell some dope. That's what I wanted to do. Go to clubs and, and have women and nice cars. That's, that's what I aspire. I never dreamed that today the Lord would use my mouth to bring healings to hundreds and thousands of people. I never dreamed that I would have good people support me, rally around me. You see, it was a time that I had nothing but bad people rallying upon me, encouraged me to do evil. But today, by the grace of God, I got some good folk around me, folk that love me and believe in me, folk that see things in me that I never thought or even dreamed that I had. See, God has given me a, a treasure. He has given me his word. He has given me his spirit. And I am so humble and grateful that today I can go about and represent him to the fullest. Thank you, Jesus. He bought me out of prison, not for me to do my thing, mm -mm. so that I can thank him, so that I can worship him. We serve a mighty God. There's nothing impossible for God. I don't care what you may find yourself in or what problem you may be facing or what kind of affliction you may be going through. God is able. You see, for many years, I didn't know nothing about God. See, I was raised in a broken home. You see, my dad abandoned me when I was born. I didn't have no identity. When my mama took me from the little island of Puerto Rico, and we ended up in the big city of New York. My mother didn't know the language didn't know the culture. And then she had a little suckling, me, with no money. We ended up in the South Bronx in New York. And listen, it was tough. I thank God for food stamps. I really do. For government assistance. That was, that's what helped to raise me. I was living in poverty. Like, never seen a Bible in my life. I never had my mama or nobody pray for me. Never. Until I ended up in prison. God prepared the belly of the beast, that belly of that, of that big old fish. He prepared that for me. And I ended up in prison. And in prison, it's, it's meant, prison is meant to punish those who commit evil acts. It's meant to, for you to lose your freedom. But in prison, in that place, I found my freedom. I was able to meet Jesus. He visited me in prison. He himself. Ain't that something? You would think <laughs> you're a castaway. You messed up. Everybody kicks you to the curb. But here my Lord and Savior was already there waiting on me. And he revealed his self to me in such a way. Let me go back a little bit when I was young. When I was young, I was confused. I experienced rejection at an early age because of the color of my skin. You see, my mother's light-skinned woman my real dad, he's a dark-skinned man. But when my mom remarried, she re married a light-skinned man. So I got four brothers. She had four more sons, and they're all white. So I was living in this home, and I didn't fit in. I never fit in. And so even in this home, I didn't feel part of. You see, I remember times when there were parties, drinking parties and binges, and the kids from around the hood would come. 
with their parents and they'll come and they'll, some of them be laughing and I'll be laughing with them, not knowing they were laughing at me. I remember this particular day, I was a young shorty and this boy was laughing so hard and I said, man, what's so funny? He said, you. He said, how in the world you claim them to be your brothers when they're white and you and you black. And that did something to me because I didn't understand. It awakened something ugly in me. I felt inferior. I felt a complex. I felt this rejection. As a matter of fact, I even felt shame. I don't know, can you relate to this, I'm gonna to explain to you, but it's like being in a classroom and the teacher draws up a problem on the board and she looks around and out of the blue, she calls you and you're not prepared. And everybody, you feel every eyeball looking at you and you don't know how to answer that question. It makes you feel like you're stupid. And that's what it made me feel. I learned something about guilt and shame. They look almost the same, but they ain't. Guilt is when you know you've done something wrong. But when you riddle with shame, it's different because when you got that shame, it makes you think that something is wrong with you. And for many years, I felt that something was wrong with me. And I felt shameful. It's like being born with a disability, maybe a crooked arm, and, and you know something is wrong, and people pick at you. People laugh at you, and they make fun of you because something is wrong with you. And I was riddled with shame for many, many years. I felt like I was a piece of crap. And that's why I indulge so much in drinking liquor, smoking dope. I used to love my dope because I couldn't handle the pain. I couldn't handle that reality. So I always wanted to fly away, escape the pain. For many years, I tortured myself. I didn't love myself. As a matter of fact, I hated myself for many years. I felt that the reason my father left me, my mama was because something was wrong with me. When I got molested, I felt that I deserved it because something was wrong with me. For many years, I carried that inside. And as a, as a result of that, I, I made some stupid choices throughout my life. I wasted so many great opportunities. I remember at one time, I joined the army. My mother made me join the army. As a matter of fact, I didn't want to join the army. And she threatened me that I was going, she was going to kick me to the streets. One day I woke up, I thought I had a bright idea. I said, I know how to get my mama off my back. I just go with her to Brooklyn, New York and take the test. And if I fail, she's not going to kick me to the streets because I tried. I end up passing the test by one little point. I must have cried for two weeks. I joined the delay entry program. My mama had to sign for me. I was 17 years old. And I went into the armed service. What a precious opportunity. But because of my stinking thinking, because of my sickness, I was sin sick. I squandered that opportunity away. I ended up in one of the meanest prison. I got court-martialed. The United States Army court-martialed me. 
and they sent me to Kansas to Fort Leavenworth hard labor. They gave me a BCD, a bad conduct discharge, kicked me out of the army. Again, something was wrong with me. I felt like I deserved it. I bought into the great lie of the devil that I was nothing but a failure, a miserable human being. Everything good that I touched, I ruined it. Married three times, failed all the marriages. Everything that came good to me, I, I looked for ways to mess it up. And deep down I felt, you ain't no good, Jamie. Something is wrong with you. And I went through these years after I got out of prison, Leavenworth, I went back to Georgia. And now I'm out, the army, no money, go back to selling dope. I did that for a while. And then I got shot six times in my chest. People that I knew, people that I've, I've sat at the table and eaten with, they laid a trap for me. I remember it was a Mother's Day, and I'm choking in my blood, and I'm choking, and my leg is shaking. I didn't know nothing about Jesus. I didn't know how to pray. I was on my way to hell. For eternity, I was going to be separated from God. And all that came to my mind was, I wish I could see my mama one more time. A helicopter came and took me from, it was some apartments in Hinesville, Georgia, in the hood. And I don't know, well, I know now Jesus. A helicopter came and flew me to Savannah, Georgia, to Memorial, a month and a half in a coma. And then one day I opened my eyes, bunch of wires. and I waited for a while to get strong. And then once I was able to move around, I moved to Florida. I started again setting up shop and selling dope. A year and a half later, I get my throat cut completely. Over 200 stitches. A woman cut my throat. She waited for me to come home with a razor blade. I didn't even feel it until something cold, all the blood. I had some dope and money in the in the house, and I heard I heard a little voice say, "Don't you go to the hospital? They're gonna check your blood. They're gonna know you got cocaine, and they're gonna give probable cause to the police to come in there. And you know what's gonna happen when the police go in there? They're gonna search and they're gonna find the dope and the money. See that dope and money gave me an identity. See, I sought my identity, my worth." and dope and money. And I was afraid that if you take that away from me, I go back to being nothing. Scum of the earth. Why, because if I had a little bit of money, a little dope, people pat me in the back. I, I made friends. I thought they were friends, but at least they acknowledged me. <laughs> and I was looking for love in all the wrong places. All I really wanted was to be accepted. All I really wanted was to have the love of a father. I don't know who's watching this right now, but if you got your daddy alive and your mama, please love on them. Please don't take them for granted. I long to have a dad that will play with me, wrestle with me. I never had it. So I took a big towel <laughs> and I tried to make a knot thinking I was going to stop the bleeding. 
I didn't. Thank God. And now I can say thank God because back then I was ignorant. <laughs> a homeboy of mine, a little homie, came and saw me through the window. He called the, the police and the doctor was amazed. I needed a, they gave me a bunch of blood transfusion. I lost so much blood. A king side bed full of blood. The doctor was amazed that I was alive. I was able to overcome that. Ain't God good? I know now that it was him preserving me. One of the reasons why I know that he preserved me and kept me from busting hell wide open was because he knew that today I was going to be making this video. It was written in heaven. It was destiny that I was going to be a preacher of the gospel. I love him so. I love him so. I read to you, bring me out of prison. He brought me out so that I can praise his name. I survived that. <laughs> I moved further down south Miami. And after a while, I was struggling. I finally met some key people with a, a big connection of dope. And, and I got in and I started working with them. And now I'm flying to the Bahamas and I'm supervising loads of cocaine to bring in uh, by boats to Miami. I'm making pretty good money. But I hated myself. You would think I'd be happy, nice cars, girls. I was miserable. I felt this big old hole. I really believe my papa is so wise. I believe that he created every human being with a hole, with a vacuum. I believe that. And he did it intentionally. <laughs> Why? Because he gave, us, he gave us a free will. So it, he created us with a vacuum, and then he let us choose how we're going to fill that hole. Hopefully, he'll sit back and say, maybe they'll try everything, and then finally they'll want to try me. And that's what happened. I used to have a lot of money, this and that, and I was empty. I was broken. <laughs> yes, when I got around people, I was the life of the party. It was all facade. It wasn't real until I met Jesus. You know, when I was selling dope and in the dope game, I always wanted to cut off the middleman. I didn't want, I wanted to go past the middleman and go straight to the big boss. I wanted to go to the plug. <laughs> you know who's my plug? Jesus. He's the ultimate plug. <laughs> He's, <laughs> he is something else. He gives you rivers of living water. Living water, he will satisfy it. He will plug up that hole. He will make us complete in him. I started selling dope. And little did I know for a whole year, the federal government was investigating me. They had tapes and pictures. I didn't know. Then one fateful day, December 2000, I mean, December 1990, my whole world caved in. They busted my home, and they came in there and threw me on the ground. And boy, they, they kicked me, and, and they wished me away to prison. That was on a Friday, December of 1990, right before Christmas. I said to myself, I'll get out Monday on bail. And God had other plans. He shut that door. When I went in front of the judge, the prosecutor, he was very prepared. And he used my past against me. That's what the devil do. He uses the past against you. The prosecutor started reading all the 
bad things that I had done in the past. I was a habitual offender three times. He used that. He convinced the judge not to give me no bail. Bail was denied. I believe if I would have got out on bail, I wouldn't be here sitting right here in this beautiful facility. Plush. This is a beautiful pad. I'll be in hell. Thank God that the judge denied me bail. At that time, I didn't realize that. I was angry. I was scared. But God knew what I needed. As a good, good father, that's who he is. He a good, good daddy. <laughs> and so they put me back in prison. And now we're preparing to go to trial. In the meantime, there was a young black man, very peculiar. And to be honest, I thought he was too happy to be in prison. And to be honest, I thought he was kind of strange. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. And because I had a perverted mind, and I don't know no better, I thought he was making a move at me because every time I would look at and, and lock eyes with him, he would smile. He had a big old grill. It looked like a Cadillac grill. He would show me all his teeth. And so, in my mind, I said, no, oh, oh, no, you ain't. And so now I started to plot to stab him. And a friend of mine bought me a piece of lead and I made a shank. We call them shank in prison. That's a knife. It's a homemade knife. And I made me a little knife. I envisioned myself. I saw myself stabbing him a bunch of times. God is my witness. I, was, I, I wanted to, I hated him. One day I was so agitated, another friend of mine came to me and said, what's wrong with you? You, you, something is eating at you. And I pointed to the black guy. I said, his name was Gene. I, I didn't know his name, but I found out his name was Gene Lawson. I said, that guy keeps showing me his teeth. And so he said, what you mean? I said, I'm going, you know, he's funny. And the, my friend said, no, he's not like that. I said, what you mean? He said, I go to visit with his family. He got a beautiful family. He got a beautiful fiance. I said, how can it be? Every time he look at me, he flashes his, all his teeth. <laughs> how in the world? He said, I promise you, it's not like that. And this is the first time I hear this phrase. He said, he's a Christian. And when he said that, I thought it was a gang. So I said, Chris, the Christians? And then he said, no, 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 he's religious. He's weak, he's, he won't hurt a fly. I said, well, why he's so happy? Then I thought, I said, well, might be that he's going home soon. And my friend says, he's not going home soon. He's already been sentenced to 294 months, 25 years. When he told me that, it shook me. Why? Why did it shook me? Because here I am, I'm, sm I'm smoking three and four packs of cigarettes every two, three days. I can't sleep at night. I'm worried, sick, I'm afraid like a kid. I'm fighting for the phone. I'm, I'm a mess. And this guy, already sentenced to 25 years. He walking around there with, looks, without a care in the world. He had a, a swag about him. He had this, this air about him like everything was going to be all right. <laughs> you see? And so it messed me up and I, because really I wanted what he had. I really wanted what, I was attracted to that. I didn't know how to get it, but I wanted it. Maybe a bunch of us Christians, maybe we need to be more consistent. Maybe we need to be more consistent. 
As a matter of fact, the Lord dealt with me years later about the word consistent. I went to preach at a church in Georgia, and I'll tell you one thing. When I left that church, I was beating myself because that church, it was cold. It, I thought I was with the Eskimos, everybody. So I got in my car, and I started beating myself up. I even told the Lord that he made a mistake in calling me, right? Because I, I didn't get no response from the folk. And I kept whining as I'm driving down the road, and the Lord stopped me. He said, son, this is the problem with a bunch of my children. You act just because you mentioned Jesus, and you go to these different venues to speak about me. You act just because you mentioned Jesus, that people are going to do cartwheels. First of all, I'm not a magic wand. Then he said, you expect people to do cartwheels and to run to the altar when they hear Jesus. You want them to trust in something they cannot see when their own father molested them and their own uncle molested them. He said, Keep quiet, I just need you to be consistent. Because consistency breeds trust. He spoke that to my heart. I said, Lord, help me to be consistent. People want to see the real thing. When you're consistent and you show yourself faithful, <laughs> that is the breeding, that is the birthplace of trust. I let the young black man with the big smile, I let him come into my space and he started telling me about this man named Jesus. Now let me be honest with you. I didn't trust this guy because everybody that ever did an act of kindness to me, they were good to me, they wanted something from me. And I thought he was just like that. And I was going to get to the bottom of it. I used to talk to him like a dog sometimes. I mistreated him a lot of times. I even challenged his manhood. God is my witness. I'm ashamed of that. I didn't know no better. I wasn't saved. <laughs> he never got angry at me. He would walk away. Two or three hours later, he would come back and bring me a soup. And the more... The more kind he was to me, the more I got mad. Why? Because I never had that in my life. I didn't know what love is or was. I didn't know. God, Jesus, manifested himself in Gene's life. And that was the hammer. Unconditional love. That was the hammer that was breaking this old heart of mine that was hard. It was callous. He started loving me. As a matter of fact, I, lot, I had a lot of hell in me. You know what he started doing? He started loving the hell out of me. That's exactly what he started doing. Then one day, he kept inviting me to the chapel. I said, no, no. And then one day, I don't know what happened. Now I do the Holy Spirit. It, it, it guided me, and I was, I'm standing in front of the little chapel in prison, and I'm hearing some songs. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grip the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. I keep hearing that. And tears start willing in my eyes. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor hold 
and grip the solid rock. I made myself in that chapel and I sat all the way in the back because I didn't want my, my homeboy to see me in church. And there was this man there, I don't know who he was, he was speaking and every word that he spoke, it was like, it was like he was speaking directly to my heart. Everything he said, I was living it. So I got paranoid. I felt like my cell was bugged. <laughs> and then I had this overwhelmed feeling of crying. I didn't want to cry in front of those people. What they going to think, that I'm soft? I, you, a, a man can't cry in no prison. You got to be a gorilla. I ran out. And I went straight to my cell. And I put some toilet tissue in my window. That'll let the officer know that I'm using the commode. But I wasn't using the commode. I was crying. It was a different kind of cry. It was a hard cry. <laughs> like, I come I hardly breathe. But also, it was like a refreshing inside of me. I can't explain it to you. I didn't even know how to pray or talk to Papa. You know what I said to him? I said, if you're real, give me what Gene has. That's what I said. The one with the teeth is. <laughs> and I cried so hard that I, lay, I went to sleep. And all of a sudden, a little while later, I heard the loudspeaker, child time, child time. It's dinner time. I jumped up, and guess what? I wasn't hungry or nothing. All I had in my heart was to look with the guy with the teeth is. I ran looking for him and I found him in the child line. And I ran up to him and I said, Gene. And I told him what happened to me in that cell. He started crying. A stranger. He wasn't Hispanic. I'm Hispanic. He wasn't Puerto Rican. He wasn't white. He was black. Crying. My daddy never cried. I never had a daddy to cry with me or for me. I felt the affection of Jesus. He, he had a little book under his armpit. He says to me, Jamie, you want to feel this peace forever? I said, yes. He opened that little book. He went to Romans chapter 10. And he read to me the plan of salvation. We got on our knees there, right on the compound in prison. And I repented of my sins. I said, Lord, I'm sorry for all the wrong that I've done. I had a change of mind. And then I received him as my Lord and Savior by faith. I received the sacrifice that he did for me on the cross. And from that day on, my journey started. I went to trial and I lost. The judge gave me a life sentence. And then they brought it down to 25 years. I went in there with a seventh grade education. I got my GED in prison. Thank you, Jesus. I learned how to read in prison. I learned how to get up in the morning. It built structure in my life. I learned discipline in prison. Not only that, but he called me to preach in prison. You know why? Because I started praying, Lord, when I get out, I'm going to preach. And the Lord spoke to me in my heart. He said, you're going to do it here. I became a missionary in prison. Different prisons. I would start Bible studies. By the grace of God, I was able to go and get my master's in prison. By the grace of God, in a hellhole, God was molding me and shaping me. He was restoring me. He was giving me the confidence in my Lord 
that I was able to rise up and be that man that he called me to be. I got a scripture and I'm going to be finishing here. But in the book of Isaiah, and I love this scripture, the book of Isaiah 42, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. This is him talking, Papa. He says, I, the Lord, have called you. Thank you, Lord. I said, Lord, how can you call me? I've been a miserable man. He said, I, the Lord, have called you. In righteousness, in his righteousness, he made me right with him. He said, and I will hold your hand, Jamie. That's why that man, the correction officer, he's still waiting on me. <laughs> but he don't understand that God got me by the hand. And if God got you by the hand, he ain't going to let you slip. No, he ain't. No, he won't. No, he won't. I promise you that. And he will hold your hand. I will keep you, Jamie, and give you as a covenant to this people. See, what he did was, I was full of, full of crap. I was dirty and filthy in the cell. He came in. By the way, he didn't wear no mask either. No, he didn't. I stink, but it didn't bother him. He came in there, and he loved me, and he cleaned me up. <laughs> he washed away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Then he packaged me up. He made me pretty. Old things are passed away, be humbly become new. See what he did? And then he didn't keep me for himself. He said, now go. And he packaged me up, and then he gave me to a people. I'm a gift to the people. Today, instead of me doing wrong and evil and being a stumbling block to people, today I'm leading people to Papa. He gave me as a covenant. As a promise, he, he gave me to the people after he cleaned me up. Don't we serve a mighty God? He don't only clean you up, but he'll put you to work too. <laughs> Look what he said. He said, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness, from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. So not only did he give me to a people, but he gave me a particular assignment, prison ministry. He said it, to open the blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. That's physical prison and spiritual prison. That's my assignment. I am called to go to the prisons. I am called to preach the good news that he come to set the captives free. I'm almost finished. If you love the word, you're going to eat this up. I wish you'd eat this up. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will give not to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. God is doing a new thing. And I know we've been, listen, it's been a tough year. We've been facing all kinds of adversity, pandemic, you know, all kinds of challenges. But I want you to know that my papa, he don't lie. He's doing a new thing. And maybe we've been too comfortable, the church. Maybe we've been too comfortable. It's time to be creative. It's time to get out out of these four walls and become the institution, which is us, we are the church, that God intended to be. 
20 years, I've been free. Who the Son set free, he's freed indeed. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I have purpose today. I'm a man of purpose. I'm a preacher. I'm a husband. I wear a different hat. I'm a father. I'm a counselor. I'm a friend today. I'm a leader in my community today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you didn't let me die. Thank you that you bestow so much mercy on me. And you deserve all the glory. And we're not going to share your glory. You're going to get it all, Papa. Thank you again, Lord. And help me the rest of my days to be faithful, Lord. Not to bring no reproach to your name. Keep me. You told me you got me by the hand. Keep me in your hand, Papa. Don't let me slip. I want to walk humbly. I don't care if you take me all around the world. I'm never going to forget where you pulled me from, and I'm not going to get too big for my breeches. I love y'all. Stay focused. Stay focused and cry out to a living God who loves you. Bye-bye. Peace. I'm out of here.